Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's discussion is titled The Price of Liberation in World War II and will feature Dr. William Hitchcock from the University of Virginia. My name is Andy Mink and I'm the Vice President of Education at the Humanities Center. Uh, we're located in Durham, North Carolina, and each year we welcome a fellowship class of university professors in the humanities who spend time at the center from Labor Day to Memorial Day doing the good work of the humanities. Uh, our job in education then is to create bridges in which that scholarship and research and insights uh, can be translated for teaching and learning. And we very much value the collegial work that we do with teachers. Uh, we like to support teacher leadership and we like to leverage content and scholarship and knowledge as one of the critical components of good teaching. So we very much appreciate you taking time from uh, your busy school day. I know we have a lot of folks from the West Coast who have probably literally just gotten out of class and others who have gotten home and, and gotten settled. Uh, we appreciate you taking some time uh, to spend uh, this evening with us. As you may know, our, our webinar is a PowerPoint associated and voice only webinar, meaning you won't be able to see us. However, you can interact. And the primary uh, interaction from you, the audience with uh, Dr. Hitchcock and myself will be through the chat box. The chat box is located at the bottom of the go to training control panel. Uh, you'll find that you can uh, type in any question, any thought, any response, any reflection to what we're sharing. Uh, my job as the moderator will be to keep my eye on those questions and to uh, insert them uh, at the appropriate time into tonight's talk. Um, occasionally the conversation gets pretty, um, pretty robust and questions tend to scroll up and if I lose one, please don't feel funny about repeating it or, or pinging it in some ways to, to make sure that I see it. Uh, you can also identify individuals to chat with and so if you've got specific questions for myself or with Libby Taylor, uh, Libby is my associate at the uh, Humanities Center and she really runs the behind the scenes of our webinar series and that includes pulling together the reading lists and the associated materials, working to create the PowerPoints with our scholars and then as importantly uh, answering any follow-up questions that you might have. So you can certainly uh, find those, those private ways to, uh, to communicate. We are going to ask that you make sure that your microphone is muted though because as much as we'd love to hear from you uh, verbally, we, uh, there will also be a whole lot of white noise with, um, with everybody if the, the microphones were, were hot. Um, the Humanities Center is really pleased to uh, continue to offer this annual series. Uh, this year we've got 25 webinars scheduled and I think you'll find uh, as you scroll through the topics, both the ones that we've completed and, as well as the ones coming up in the winter and spring semesters, um, that we've really tried to approach this from a, a riff from the headlines perspective. That is to say, uh, it's important for us to find curricular uh, connections in all of our webinars. We want to provide uh, insights from scholars that make a, make a difference in what you teach. On the other hand, we also recognize that there's a lot of extracurricular teaching that happens in the classroom. That is, uh, conversations and topics and questions that kids have when they walk into your classroom. Uh, they have them at lunchtime, they have them in the hallway, they have them uh, as conversations kind of eddy out and go in different directions. And we really like to provide some context so you feel more comfortable navigating those complex topics. And while tonight uh, on the surface may feel like um, you know, a very specific World War II conversation, and it will be, um, I think you'll find that there are some parallels with, uh, with modern conflicts that might be an interesting thing for, uh, for you to be able to explore. We try to find a lot of ways to support teaching and learning at the Humanities Center. That includes our online archive and repository of lessons and resources. Uh, I would encourage you to visit American Class and take a look at those resources. Um, they're free, they're open, uh, they're easily downloadable, and uh, if you do find a way, if they find a way into your own teaching and instructional planning, we'd, we'd love to hear how you use those. Our webinar series, again, is an important part of this bridge. Uh, it's the next step in terms of connecting scholars with you teachers and vice versa. I will say that um, this year's sessions are really starting to sell out pretty quickly. So tonight's session is sold out. Uh, we've got several in the spring and the winter that have already reached our 200 person maximum. Um, take a look at, uh, at our website, uh, go through the titles. If there's anything that's interesting to you and you legitimately think you can uh, carve the time out that night, please go ahead and sign up. Um, we are finding that it's a good problem to have, but we are finding that our, our webinars are selling out and we do have a cap of 200 per session. One of the things that we um, really lean heavily on to make sure that the work we do is relevant for the classroom is work closely with the Teachers Advisory Council. Uh, some of these uh, uh, teachers are with us tonight. I see Jenny Snotty down there in Cobb County, uh, Georgia. Um, they are really uh, critical. They're essential for us to make sure that we stay 
um, applicable for the classroom. I think sometimes there's a, a danger with any content provider, with any university, with any nonprofit, of doing what we think you, you as teachers might want or need. Uh, in this case, these 14 excellent teachers um, help us understand what is most appropriate and most relevant. And I want to thank them for their service this year and also encourage any of you in tonight's session, should you be interested in joining our council next year, uh, look for applications uh, sometime in early spring. When tonight's session is completed, you will receive a prompt to do a survey, and then from that survey, you will receive a certificate to download. Uh, please take a look and make sure that this um, that the emails that you receive from us and from Code to Training are not being hung up in your email spam filter. Uh, we do find that on occasion that does that does occur, but you should be able to uh, download download that certificate usually within an hour or so, and and you can turn that into the appropriate administration to get credit for your time tonight. Um, so really, that's a backdrop. Those, those are logistics. Those are nuts and bolts to get to really what we're here for, and that is to talk about this, the price of liberation in World War II. And I alluded earlier to maybe some parallels that uh, would be interesting to explore in terms of modern day conflict. But you know, it strikes me that, uh, that that tackling this topic today, December 7th, is, is appropriate as well, not because Pearl Harbor has anything to do with what we're talking about tonight, but it does serve as one of those iconic stories of celebration and liberation that that we tell. We're very good as, uh, as Americans as um, in, the, in our United States history uh, curriculum of telling and remembering, very appropriately remembering and commemorating uh, the victories of uh, our conflicts in the past. And I think underneath that, the layer that sometimes we miss and the layer that sometimes might be um, a very uh, appropriate thing to share with younger students is, is the cost of that, is the on the ground, uh, in the cities, in the civilian world, in the landscape, in the uh, population, in the agriculture, you know, what the cost of that might look like. And I have a feeling as we work through tonight's session with, uh, with Will that you, you might actually see some images that, um, that have a pretty explicit connection with images we can see today from conflicts. Um, millions of people displaced by warfare and conflict, millions of people moving just for safety, moving to uh, uproot their life and try to find uh, somewhere else where they can, they can resettle. And it might be an interesting thing to consider that conversation as, as we work through this now um, from, from the uh, World War II era. So I say that as an introduction and invitation really to, uh, to ask uh, Professor Hitchcock these questions and to um, sort of find those connections, but really we're here to, we're here to hear from him. And well, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, hello in Charlottesville. Uh, Professor, can you hear me? Let's see, Will, I'm going to make sure that you are unmuted. Nope, that's the wrong Will. Hey there, Will, can you hear me? Hello, Professor Hitchcock, can you hear me? There you are. You. There you are. I can hear you now as well. Thank you for joining there us. There we go. Thank you for having me. Well, good afternoon or good, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Will Hitchcock. You've got my picture up on the screen. I teach history uh, here at the University of Virginia. It's a it's a real honor to to be a part of this, and I just uh, I salute you for joining the conversation and for uh, coming and, and and being a part of this this discussion. The topic that I'll talk about tonight is not an easy one. It's not a particularly joyful one, but I I think it's really important, and I hope I can persuade you of that tonight. Um, as Andy said, today is December seventh, so that means that 76 years ago, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, brought the U.S. into World War II. And in a way, in a sort of a, uh, an abstract way, but, but also a concrete way, we've been at war almost ever since, if you think about it. World War II and the Korean War and the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, the, the Global War on Terror, they've all taken young Americans, just a lot of the kinds of young people that you all teach, um, and put them in harm's way uh, at different times and in different places. So as a nation, we do have quite a lot of experience with war. 
But what I want to suggest tonight is, uh, and I've thought a lot about this, I've tried to work through this problem, we don't often do as good a job as we might in, in teaching the human dimension of war. That is, the impact that war has on the soldiers who fight it. And of course, on the civilians who get caught up uh, in the mix and the families and the societies that endure conflict. And we see on our you know, nightly news the, the terrible damage that war does uh, all around the world, but often it's at such a distance, it's difficult to know what's it really like to be in the middle of it. And of course, it's very difficult. But I do think we have an obligation to engage and to try to figure out what, what are the consequences of war for uh, the soldiers who fight it and for the civilians who experience it. And tonight, I just want to give you one example of how um, how I've been trying to teach and to talk about this new approach to a history of war that incorporates uh, both the battlefield and the civilian or human experience uh, of the conflict. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite a ride, and I hope that you will enjoy it, uh, um, the, the, the material that I brought together for you tonight. I have a lot of uh, a lot of images that I'm going to talk through, and I hope that some of them will stimulate uh, thinking in your own mind about how you could apply this approach to contemporary issues. So we're going to be using as our case study the landings of uh, Allied troops on the coastline of Normandy, France, in June of 1944, the famous D-Day landings. And just to remind you, Normandy, uh, France, is in the northern part of France. It's a, probably an hour, 45 minutes, two hour train ride from Paris if you were to go um, directly west. And of course, most significant of the geography, and I'll show some maps, is that it borders on the English Channel. Um, and when we talk about D-Day, we usually think about the heroic young Americans who landed there on June 6, 1944. And they fought their way up from the, the shoreline uh, to, uh, to, to meet, to engage the German defenders who were ready for them. Uh, and they engaged them and they defeated them. And the fighting was carried out by young men. And we might even call these young men uh, uh, boys. And I'm just going to advance the uh, screen so that you can see just, for example, the face of one young man. You might say he was a boy. It's hard to know what his age is. But this is a very typical face of an American soldier in this June of 1944. He looks bewildered. He doesn't know where he is. It's hard to say if he's maybe 22 years old. He probably should be sitting in a, in a freshman college uh, English class. But he's sitting on Omaha Beach uh, on the day of the landings. And this is the face of you know, one face of war, a disoriented, wounded, and uncertain uh, young man far from home. And I, I think it's uh, important for us to try to figure out who is, a, who is that boy and what, is, what, did he, what has he just been through. So on D-Day, about 2,000 Americans died in seizing the French coastline from the German uh, defenders and about 1,000 others, other soldiers, Allied soldiers, were killed, mostly British and Canadians. But of course, the soldiers weren't the only ones who died or who suffered, and in many ways, so too did, did, did civilians. And we'll, we're going to look at some of the ways in which they, too, uh, suffered. This is a photograph of the city of Caen, that's C-A-E-N, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that city, which was a target of D-Day, and as you can see, it was badly destroyed uh, in the conflict. And we're also going to be thinking about who are these people? Well, these were, uh, this is a, a mother and a child, other kinds of victims of D-Day, if you like. They were, of course, liberated by the war, so that's a good thing, but as you can see, uh, refugees are also a product of war. And here's a young girl who's fallen asleep on a, on a bedroll, probably all the possessions that they've taken out of their house, and a mother uh, weeping, turning her face away from the camera. Perhaps she doesn't want to be seen, uh, overcome by the stress. And one thing that you can kind of guess by looking at this photograph is that it's really hot. And the summer of 1944 in Normandy was very, very hot. And so they're sweating and they're in the glare. I mean, it's just a terribly uh, a moving photograph to me. Well, in the long run, France, of course, was liberated after the long summer of 1944. It's a very difficult, uh, difficult time for France. And if you go to Normandy today, if, you, if you're lucky enough to go there and see some of the, the, uh, the landing beaches and the battlefields, you'll find that people there are very much aware of how much Americans did. Uh, to defeat the Germans and to rescue France. And Americans are very popular in this part of France, which is not always true of 
all of France. Uh, French people really did rejoice in their liberation. I just want to show you a, a, a visual image of this. This is a poster that was put out by the French government in 1945, and it shows a visual emotion of what liberation feels like. I mean, look at this, this portrait of, of, a, of a stylized female figure wearing the French flag, and she, uh, France is, is depicted as a female often in, in public images like this. And she's lifting a great big stone off and up, away. What is it? She's coming out of a tomb. This is a, this is a resurrection. And behind her uh, are these kind of uh, underworld figures who are also being released from their, their underworld tomb by liberation. So this, is, this gives you a sense for the enormous delight that the people of France felt during and after the liberation. Uh, there's no doubt that, uh, that they were enormously pleased by the, um, by the outcome. And on the right-hand side here, you see a wonderful picture, uh, which um, I'm sure was staged by the photographer, because those children are really, really interested in sewing, which I don't think is often the case with little kids. But what you see is a French girl in a Norman village sewing an American flag using some scraps that she's uh, been given perhaps by her, her mother in the background and preparing to welcome their liberators. And this is a classic image of a, of a Franco-American friendship um, as a result of the liberation. And I don't want to lose sight of that. This is real. And uh, French people were incredibly grateful then and they're incredibly grateful now for what Americans did and how many uh, young men and, and women sacrificed their lives for them. But underneath it, there's a different image. You can see a little bit of it on the right of the consequences. And I think what we have as a challenge before us is a, is a way to talk about conflict that balances the heroism, the genuine heroism that war brings out in people alongside some of the suffering and some of the, the, the human costs and, of course, the cost to the built environment. Um, and so this is what we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, let me just remind you all, I'm sure you know all this, but very, very quickly remind you of the larger context um, of what's going on in the France that was liberated. Right, The soldiers arrive in a foreign country, they often don't know what's going on in the background. And in this case, they, they really didn't know much about what they would expect when they got to France. But what they found was a France that had been really cruelly mistreated by the Germans. And I just want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, in, in 1940, at the beginning of the war, uh, the French army was defeated by the German invasion swept down into France. And these are German soldiers marching uh, down the Champs-Élysées in Paris, uh, demonstrating their victory. And there are a lot of theories about, you know, why did France give in? Why was it beaten so easily, so quickly? What, what happened? I mean, if you think about it, in World War I, the French and the Germans fought each other to a standstill for four long years. Uh, but in World War II, it just took six weeks for the Germans to knock the French out and seize Paris and occupy the country. An extraordinary um, defeat. And really, the French uh, had, you know, obviously didn't anticipate it and, and never got over it. it. It probably had something to do with, you know, better German training, better German use of mobility and tanks and aircraft. Probably it had something to do with the poor French generalship and poor leadership. But I just want to stress, because I think this is a point Americans uh, tend to, 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 uh, to miss, it, it did not have anything to do with the lack of courage on the part of those French soldiers or Britain soldiers who were fighting. Some of you may have had the chance to see the movie Dunkirk in the theaters uh, this last year, which gives you an idea of the, the, the chaos and the difficulty of that, that particular moment in the war. But about 360,000 Allied soldiers were killed or wounded in this opening battle of France. So they fought hard and they fought courageously, the French did, but they were beaten by a more powerful, better trained army in 1940. Okay, so the Germans come barging into France, they defeat the French army, and once the French military was defeated, things started to get very difficult. The French government turned over political power to a famous general, a World War I general. His name was Henri-Philippe Pétain. That's P-E-T-A-I-N, Pétain. 
Now, Peitain's role was to sign a peace deal with the, arm, with the Germans, an armistice, a, a, a peace, to stop the fighting and to work out a new political arrangement with the conquerors, with the Germans. And this was a terribly humiliating experience, as you might imagine, for a famous general, a military general, to have to endure uh, and, and Pétain at this time was uh, very well known in, in France and he was a much admired figure. He had uh, a great history behind him. He was in his mid-80s. He was a, a politically very conservative figure, an authoritarian figure, uh, but he had a lot of prestige and the, the government turned over power to this general and they said, Marshal Pétain, please sign the armistice and, and tell us what to do. And that turned out to be rather a big mistake. The armistice was signed between Pétain and the German government in 1940, and it was a very, very punishing one for France. They had to give up their army. Uh, they had to uh, allow the German military occupation of two-thirds of the country. And they agreed to pay, to pay out of their own pockets, the French, the costs of the German occupation. Now, in return for all this, they got a small degree of political freedom, political autonomy over France. And it was Pétain and his government that exercised political power in France during the war. Throughout the entire war, Pétain was in charge. And the French government set up a new headquarters in a small, hitherto kind of unknown little, little town called Vichy. And in Vichy is where they set up their headquarters. And that became the, the, um, the place in which the French government uh, tried to run its sort of, its sort of uh, area of autonomy in France. Now, Pétain became the head of the state and he imposed basically a fascist regime in France. It was totally anti-democratic. It was anti-Semitic. It was anti-American. It was really a bad, bad group of people. Now, Pétain collaborated with uh, the Germans in many respects. Uh, he rounded up, uh, participated with the Germans in rounding up resistance members. Um, eventually, the French government uh, helped the Germans in, in arresting and deporting uh, Jewish people, both refugees from elsewhere in Europe as well as French Jews. And they also turned over to Germany young men who were working in, supposed to have to work in German factories during the war effort. So this government of, of Pétain did a great deal to, to collaborate with this horrible man on the right, Adolf Hitler. France became essentially a vassal state of the Nazi empire. And Pétain accepted this, and it's a terrible, terrible shame, an enduring shame um, that the French have had to deal with. So what does this mean? It means that during the war, France endured serious hardship. On the one hand, they were occupied by this harsh German occupation. They were being squeezed for money and for food and for labor. And they had to endure arrests and deportation. And it's just you know a, a very difficult time that the Germans imposed on France. But also, France went through a kind of civil war, French against French, because Pétain waged a kind of war against his own people, he rounding up the French resistance, arresting and, and having them executed in some cases, um, helping to deport uh, French Jews and others. So it was a very, very awful four long years that the French endured. So when our heroes, our liberators, arrive uh, and they, they encounter the French in the summer of 1944, you know, France is not a happy place. It's a, it's a war-weary place. Uh, there are beaten people. They're divided. They're exhausted and divided against themselves. I stress all this because I think we might have a somewhat caricatured idea that the French were... Um, sort of sitting around during the war, uh, riding bicycles and wearing berets and putting the baguette under their arm and cycling around town and having a rather nice old time. And I think that's a, something of a caricature. In fact, it was a very difficult time for most French people. And the liberators who came encountered this sort of troubled society that was already at the tail end of a long period of, 
of exploitation and occupation. Well, let me ask you just a quick question. Um, you've, you've outlined um, particularly this, this anti or this counter narrative to that caricature really well. But just to tie one last little thread together, James Adams asks and wonders if uh, the French impression of Germany was colored at all by the punitive arrangements. Were they essentially unprepared because they expected Germany to be weak for a longer period than they were? Um, unprepared for Germany at the beginning of the war. Uh, you mean the, uh, unprepared to deal with the conflict? Well, um, I think that the 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 many of the divisions that occurred in France during the war uh, had a prehistory, and France in the 1920s and the 1930s was politically in a great deal of turmoil. They were divided amongst themselves between right and left, between uh, a rising uh, right wing and an authoritarian movement and a communist movement. So France was a country that was deeply divided politically speaking. And what that means is they were not preparing well their national security to deal with the rising German threat. So at the beginning of the war, when the war broke out, um, the, 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 the question in the back of the minds of many French people was, uh, what kind of France are we fighting to save? And there was such disaffection and such political turmoil that it was a, it was a somewhat weak and divided France that went to war against this German machine. And that, I think, has a lot to do with explaining the, um, the, the lack of political, strong political leadership at the top. I do think French soldiers fought courageously, but they were... They were really led by awful generals in 1940, unfortunately, and many of those generals didn't feel a great deal of alarm at, at protecting uh, to protect the republic, and may even have been wishing for a kind of victory uh, for the Germans because they felt that it was an opportunity to to impose a dramatically new country uh, in France. Thank you. All right, so let's get back onto our story. This is a familiar face, I think, to many of you, and uh, this is the man who is going to set things uh, right. The Allied forces, um, under the leadership of General Eisenhower, pictured here, uh, had long been planning to land in France. They had to get an army into France um, at some point, and they knew that they did because that's where the Germans were. The only way to get to Berlin in, uh, in large, a large scale uh, for the Americans was going to be coming uh, from, from, through France and through Western Europe staging a gigantic uh, operation first in Britain and then moving across the English Channel onto the continent. And Eisenhower knew this and had been preparing for this in many ways since the very beginning of the war. Um, but the hard work of putting together the invasion of France really gets starting, started only in January 1944. And the task of sending a big army uh, to France is enormous. And I, I do just you know, want to stress the scale of this. And I'll be showing you a few maps, but look at the enormous scale trying to get a, a gigantic fighting forces across the English Channel onto the continent of France and then arming them and preparing them for a, f a conflict in Germany was an overwhelming and very, very difficult uh, uh, challenge. And it, and it faced uh, Eisenhower with an enormous, uh, unprecedented uh, uh, problem. How do you do all of these things, train and equip an invasion of force of what will be eventually about a million soldiers that will come through uh, into Normandy in the first month after D-Day. And by the way, you've got to do this while you're keeping it secret from the enemy because you don't want the Germans to know where you are landing. So there's a great deal of effort to hide the, um, the operation. The Germans have spies in Britain. They know that there's a big landing being staged, but they don't know where it's going to land. And part of the effort is deception, is to deceive the Germans of where they're going to land. But then you've got to to, to develop all the ships, and you've got to, to train the men to get on the ships to carry them across the English Channel, and they all have to be supplied with food, ammunition, weapons, and so on. You have to land this force right onto the heavily defended coast of France, and then you have to defeat the Germans and liberate the country. Obviously, it is not a small problem. It's, a ve it's an unprecedented uh, problem in, uh, uh, in scale, and Eisenhower was the man who had to solve the issue. The preparations uh, that go on during 1944 are immense, and it's worth just noting some of the details here because it just gives you a sense of how, uh, how hard it was to carry out the invasion and the liberation of France. 130,000 soldiers were going to be landed just on the first day, just on the first day, uh, on the beaches of France. And then 1.2 million would follow up in the 90 days after that. 
They needed over 130,000 vehicles of different kinds. They needed over 4,000 tracked vehicles to get up on the sand and carry large numbers of soldiers. They needed over 3,000 artillery pieces. They needed ammunition. They needed weapons, food, medical supplies. You get the picture. It's not as if you could snap your fingers and say, well, I think the army should land there and point your finger at the map. Rather, you had to plan for a year or two years to prepare for this enormous challenge of getting an army across a difficult body of water, the English Channel, onto a heavily defended beach. A number of innovations had to be made. And these are, these are pictures of things you may have seen before, but these, these derive in order to solve a particular problem. How do you get troops from a big ship out in the middle of the ocean, put them onto landing craft, and then get that little landing craft um, onto the last few thousand yards of water onto a beach? So they had to develop a new kind of ship, the landing craft, the Higgins boats, that could take all those soldiers, get them up onto the beach, and have the front of the boat drop open so that the soldiers could rush out onto the beach. And they had to do the same thing with tanks. So all of these problems had to be solved back home in the United States. These pieces of equipment had to be designed, tested, and built, and then shipped to Britain. So you begin to see the enormous scale uh, and scope of this operation. What about tanks? Everyone loves to have tanks if you're invading a, a, foreign, a foreign country, but how do you get them up onto the beach? Well, one of the inventions that was designed for D-Day with, I'm sorry to say, very mixed record, was the swimming tank, which sounds like if ever there was an oxymoron, a swimming tank would seem to be it. But they decided that they could wrap a canvas apron, a skirt, around a Sherman tank, and that thing would go up to, to cover the turret, and then they put a propeller on the back of the tank, so this thing could actually swim a few thousand yards through water without sinking and get itself up onto the beach. It turned out to have a very bad record in terms of uh, surviving the trip because so many of them uh, entered the water in choppy water and they sank, taking their entire crew to the bottom of the ocean, unfortunately. The objective of all this activity, and here are the iconic names that I'm sure you've all heard of, the objective of this uh, activity was there were the five landing beaches, the five invasion beaches in, um, in Normandy. And going from right uh, to left, they were Sword, Juno, and Gold, and those three were the targets of the British and the Canadian soldiers, Omaha Beach, and Utah Beach, which were the targets of the American uh, landing uh, uh, units. Why were they going here? It's important to notice that they could have picked a, uh, a part of France that was a little closer to Berlin, but they liked this area for a couple reasons. One is the city of Cherbourg was a port. They hoped to seize the city of Cherbourg and use its port facilities to begin to ship more and more and more material into France for the future of the, uh, for the summer and uh, fighting and on into the campaign. There was also a city named Caen, C-A-E-N, which was on a rail line. So if they could take Caen, they could uh, grab a hold of the railway system and then they would have an advantage in shipping uh, men and material back and forth across, uh, across uh, northern France. And of course, most of all, it was a kind of beach that they could land on because it was so low and so um, open. And I'll show you a few photographs of that. Now, the plan of D-Day begins the night before with airborne troops. 8,000 British and 16,000 American troops are going to be flown in at midnight, the night of June 5 and 6. And they're flown in over the, from Britain, over the English Channel at nighttime, 82nd Airborne, 101st Airborne. And their goal is to drop down on their parachutes behind the landing beaches and to seize uh, important railroad crossings and street crossings and to engage the German troops to draw them away from the landing beaches. And if you've had a chance to look at any of the readings, and I want to draw your attention to them, there's a wonderful description in one of the short pieces that I, I sent out ahead of time. There's a book uh, called Parachute Infantry by David Kenyon Webster, who was a paratrooper on D-Day. And if, if, if you, know, you could share this with your students, it's really easy to read for them, but it gives a first-person account of what it was like to be a paratrooper on that night. Uh, 
And what he talks about is how unbelievably uncomfortable he was as he gets into the airplane. He says, my body was steaming hot. I sat down and closed my eyes and tried to go to sleep, but the weight of my chute and my equipment was too oppressive. I began to think of the water we would pass over and of my chances of getting free of my harness in time to prepare for a water landing. I hope I don't land in the channel or the river, I thought. I drowned before I could get free of my chute. And then he goes on, he gets onto the airplane and it carries him up into the darkness along with his, his unit. Um, he talks about the incredible noise of the airplane, the terrible uh, smell of men getting sick on the plane, the total blackness, you know, they're flying at night um, and they have no idea where they're going exactly or, or, or what's below them. Um, he says, the moon went behind a cloud and I, I sat back at my position, suspended in the darkness, lit only by cigarettes. I felt as if I were in the wildest of bad dreams. And he's flying on over into the night. Come on, I whispered to myself, let's get it over with. So you get a sense for the impatience of the soldiers on the eve of the liberation. Someone vomited near the door. The smell mingled with the oily engine odors and the smoke of the cigarettes and made another man vomit, etc. You get the picture. He is in a state of, of absolute agony, but, but, but not fearful, just impatient and eager to get it going. Finally, the moment comes, the door of the airplane is ripped open. Go, the lieutenant shouted. He bent over and lifted the ends of the parapax, slid them out the door and jumped after them. The line of men surged forward. On it goes. They all jump out into the darkness. And he says, his last thing he says before he jumps, all I could see was water, miles and miles of water. He thought he was going to drown. Turns out he landed in the swamps. Uh, the area was badly, um, uh, was full of swamps and uh, and, and uh they hadn't anticipated exactly where they were going to land. The result was that the airdrops were scattered, they were ineffective, and they were badly organized. But he survived uh, the drop. But it's a wonderful short memoir that you could use in your students, with your students, just to talk about the, the state of mind of, of a soldier on the eve of combat. Well, of course, the next morning, the, the, the famous event happens, June 6, 1944. It's a gray day, rainy, very, very windy. The, the surf and the chop is very, very uh, uh, unpleasant and difficult. The massive armada of ships approaches the shore, and there are battleships and cruisers as well as very large uh, and naval craft that start defend, smashing the Germans on the shore. And overall, there are over 6,000 boats that are in the water on this day, carrying the soldiers and their equipment across the channel towards the British, towards the, uh, the, the Germans on the beach. Here's a, another detailed map, which you can come back to at, at your leisure, just to see exactly where they were aiming and what they were trying to accomplish. Uh, their goal was to get a beachhead fairly far into um, Normandy, and, and they came up short, but they, of course, did secure their beachhead on um, June 6th. There are two pictures here that I want you to look at a little bit closely because I think they're, well you may have um, seen that this photograph or one much like it before, I just want to bring to your attention one thing, a couple things. First of all, these men are in the in a boat uh, about to be about to be uh, driven onto the, the shore. You can already see there's smoke and flames on Omaha Beach already there from the naval gunnery. Uh, the Germans are already firing at these men. Um, their ship is going, their boat's going to land on those uh, on those beaches straight ahead, and then that front of that boat's going to drop down. They're going to they're going to run out. But look at how much they're carrying. They each have a steel helmet. They've got canvas outfits. They've got a heavy backpack. They're wearing boots, and they're, some of them are carrying shovels. Others are carrying certain pieces of equipment. Those guys, if they get into any kind of water, they're going to be in real trouble. And indeed, that's exactly what happens if you look at this second photograph. You see the men wading through the water to get onto the beaches. Of course, they have to get across the beaches and then up to the, up to the, uh, the hill. But you see how deep the water is. For some of them, it's up to their armpits, and they're carrying a 60-pound back, backpack that is now being absolutely saturated with seawater. After getting struggling to the dry land, then they're going to have to run across a few thousand miles of open beach with the Germans firing machine guns at them. That's what awaited them on Omaha Beach in, on June 6th of 1944. Again, I, I just want to bring to your attention the texture of this moment. 
And as you talk to your students about conflict and soldiering, um, ask them how much a gun like this, a rifle like this, might weigh. Um, if you ever picked up one of these, you'd be amazed at how heavy they are or were. Um, how much weight are these men carrying on their back, etc.? So try to think a little bit about the physicality of this moment, not to mention the terror of being fired at by the Germans in the hills beyond. Uh, Will, let me ask you a quick question. Um, these are some really powerful images. I'm seeing in the chat box a lot of folks are commenting on the maps and the images and the, the way that you're telling your story through these visuals. Uh, and this one in particular seems a little unique in that there's it's the point of view of the duck boat, right, of, of sort of looking onto the beach. Where do you find uh, is the best archive to, to find images like this, or where do you go for these kinds of primary sources? That's a, that's a great question. There, we're, we're blessed with a lot of uh, really superb um, sources, and a lot of these photographs are in the public domain because they were taken by uh, the U.S. Army Signal Corps, so they're available for, for use and for publication dissemination. Uh, the National World War II Museum is a great source uh, located in New Orleans, but um, it's become the real go-to place for uh, resources on um, on on uh, on World War II, I have also uh, had a lot of success with the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, it's hit or miss, but they do have they have digitized a great many photographs um, from the from the war. And and if if you're if you're really eager, you can go to the Library of Congress, but um, it's a little more of a of a challenge um, to find them. But they've digitized uh, quite a lot of material, and so have the National Archives at NARA dot gov n a r a dot gov. Um, so that that's a that's a great. I, I've done some research myself in the National Archives World War II collections in the photographs, and you'd be a, I I just found it endlessly fascinating to go through the thousands and thousands of snapshots taken by Army photographers, and you see the most extraordinary things. Um, it's it's um, it's really just a, an amazing way into the uh, the visual moment that these uh, that these soldiers experienced. And actually, as a follow-up question, this comes from Lee Holder, who is here in eastern North Carolina. It will give you the chance to be a Snopes uh, fact checker right now. Uh, Lee asks, is it true that many of these first wave photographs were accidentally destroyed back in the UK in a rush to see them and some, you know, there was a opening the dark room door a little too soon uh, kind of accident. Have you ever heard that, that rumor, that myth? I haven't heard that before. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was such a story, but um, I, I haven't heard it before. Mm. But I would say that um, this is the, the scale of this operation is so huge. There wasn't just one guy with one camera and and, sure. and one roll of film. Um, we have we have uh, an enormous number of photographs from uh, from this day um, as a consequence of, of of a lot of different eyes on the uh, on the scene. So um, while I that's, that's, it sounds perfectly plausible, but but I do know that we have available to us a large number of photographs um, to, to look at. Great, class half full. Thank you, Will. Yeah, so um, so so that's the that's the opening salvo, and I'm going to carry the story on a little bit. I've taken a couple of color pictures of this landscape because it's so beautiful now, um, and I just want to share with you uh, what it looks like and get you um, thinking about what it might be like if you were a German and you were looking down. At the beaches, and you that blue sea was filled with six thousand boats carrying American and British and Canadian soldiers up to get you. You would be terrified, but you'd also be glad that you were one hundred or two hundred feet above above the beach and that you were sitting in a concrete gun emplacement and you were ready um, and and uh, able to see the soldiers the American soldiers coming across this beach. Look at how vulnerable those Americans would have been. This is above Omaha Beach. They had to get across all of that sand, carrying all of their heavy waterlogged equipment under a rain of fire from the Germans. To me, going there uh, and seeing the landscape, seeing the scale of the whole thing really kind of blew my mind because um, I just felt so much for those youngsters getting out of their Higgins boats and just thinking, wait a minute. The, the, de the, the destination is still across all of this open ground. There's nowhere to hide. And indeed, um, that's the reality. Even to this day, there are plenty of concrete emplacements because the Germans had been preparing to defend the French coastline for years. They knew the Americans would come eventually to uh, land in France. They had spent a couple of years uh, building 
uh, a long stretch of defenses all up and down the French coastline. They had, uh, it, it, it wasn't an impregnable fortress, but it was a very, very daunting uh, and, and sophisticated set of defenses that the Germans had built into the hills um, above the beaches, not just here in Normandy, but all the way along the French coastline. Again, the Germans had expected this, and here's a wonderful cross-section, a visual of what the Allied soldiers had to get across as they were getting up to meet the Germans. You can see right from the beginning, uh, from going from left to right, there were all kinds of obstacles underneath the waterline that the boats would possibly uh, uh, hit, and maybe it would cause their small little boats to tip over. There were mines in the water stuck on these posts designed to catch onto any boat coming along and blow it up. There were ramps with mines on top of them designed to tip over the boats. There were these terrible sort of star-shaped things made of steel welded together also uh, under the waterline that would catch on any boat coming. There was barbed wire, there were minefields, and then once you get out of the water, why you have to go across all of that beach and you have to encounter the Germans with their machine guns behind concrete emplacements. In short, it was a terrifying prospect what the uh, Allies were trying to accomplish on that day. This is just a, a wonderful example <clears throat> a few days after uh, D-Day, just to give you an idea of the, the wreckage and the, the, the mess and the, the, the so sort of you could almost you could almost smell the burning oil and the all of the all of those things in the water there were put by the Germans to uh, try to, to as obstacles that the Allied ships would catch on and uh, complicate their their progress onto the beaches. Well, despite all that, the miraculous uh, um, uh, landings were successful, and I'll just uh, I'll wrap up the military side of things in a moment here, just by saying that the, uh, the the landings went remarkably well, and in most cases they went better than expected. On the British beaches, Sword, Juno, and Gold, um, the uh, Germans were. Um, the, the resistance was less severe, less sustained than elsewhere, than in Omaha. Um, and the British or the Canadians moved inland fairly briskly without a great deal of losses. They did have some casualties naturally, but the German forces um, were not at greatest strength where the British and the Canadians landed. And overall, the British had very good results. They had hoped to get all the way to the city of Caen. They didn't quite make it, but they, they did do reasonably well on that day, losing 3,000 casualties, far less than they had feared. So that's a good piece of news. Of course, it was on Omaha Beach that was the most difficult. And this is the subject, if many of you have seen it, you should show it to your students, although I would give them a little warning ahead of time. The first 15 minutes of uh, Saving Private Ryan is without a doubt the most effective um, the depiction of combat ever, really ever put on screen. It's a Steven Spielberg movie, Saving Private Ryan. I'm sure many of you know it. I highly recommend it, it to you, though really do watch it ahead of time first by yourself and, and determine if, if your kids uh, you know, can digest it because it's really extraordinarily vivid and, and moving and, and difficult to watch. On Omaha Beach, it was very heavily defended by the Germans. And a number of things went wrong. It became a sort of perfect storm. The initial bombing by the Air Force and by the Navy was too far inland, so it hadn't damaged the German defenses adequately. The seas were very choppy, and many of the those tanks with their funny little wrappings, their little apron, they sank. Um, there wasn't, uh, so they didn't have tanks to help them get onto the beach and fight off the uh, fight their way onto the into the German positions. The sea was very choppy. The tide was for some reason particularly difficult at that point, and, and that really had a very bad effect on the landing craft. The obstacles were terrible. Um, there are sandbars hidden to view, but uh, all of these things just combined into a disaster. Um, and so Omaha Beach was a place in which the men really did uh, suffer significant casualties, um, despite the fact that they did finally get across this wide open beach in the teeth of the um, of the machine gunning and get up onto the slight shelter of the rise that you can just make out on the right. And the last beach, Utah Beach, um, which had relatively relatively good fortune, most of the tanks made it ashore and they had, did reasonably well to meet up with those airborne troops that had 
I landed the night before. I'll just show you one interesting picture. This is an example of what they encountered on Utah Beach, which was a concrete seawall um, where they could take shelter, and that allowed uh, the early first waves to get a little bit of a catch their breath and, and renew their courage uh, for, the, uh, for the continued assault up the hills towards the German positions. And the last thing I'll, I'll just say is what really wanted in the end of the day was persistence. These, uh, these regiments kept, kept pushing in. They gradually cut the barbed wire. They blew up the beach obstacles, and they moved their ways up toward uh, the small towns on the coastline, losing uh, significant casualties, but far less than Eisenhower had feared uh, would happen. So that's the military narrative, and I, I, I'm going to stop because I have a lot of other material to share with you, but I'm happy to take questions now about the military story before I move into the civilian side of things. You know, I think you addressed this um, both, I think explicitly, but certainly implicitly. Andrew uh, Nappy asks, how was the Air Force used in helping these troops to secure the beaches? And you alluded to some of that, but did the Air Force play a, a pretty uh, important role? Yes, air power was terribly important, and uh, the, 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 um, it was one of the most important achievements of the war was that the British and the American Air Forces gradually mastered the skies over Western Europe. It took them many years to do that, a lot of courageous air fighting. But over time, the Americans and the British wore down the German Luftwaffe, the, the German Air Force, and, and took control of the skies. And that was crucial because it meant the Germans couldn't destroy the Allied ships as they were sitting there, sitting ducks in the English Channel. There wasn't much of a German air threat to the landing craft. Now, Specifically, that meant that the that the Air Force could, therefore, command the skies and did a great deal of bombing runs over the Normandy beaches to try to dislodge the Germans from their defended positions. But, you know, um, explosives, air ordnance, that is, the bombs that airplanes dropped in World War II were nothing like as powerful as they are today. And it's very difficult to um, hit with any kind of accuracy a small concrete emplacement. So the Germans uh, were, were not. Um, neutralized before the landings. And that's one of the reasons that, for example, at Omaha Beach, the fighting was so bitter because the Air Force had not been able to, to uh, kick the, get the Germans out of their little emplacements. Right. One, one last question before we transition. Um, you know, this is clearly a, uh, an iconic story. How long did it take for this story, this narrative, to get back to the American public? Well, that's a, a really good um, question and actually is a nice transition to the, to the primary source that I wanted to bring your attention to. Um, uh, I'll just uh, advance over that one. I just wanted to bring to your attention this slide. I, I included in the readings a couple of primary sources and probably the most important figure in relating a lot of this uh, story um, to the American public without a lot of its detail was Ernie Pyle. And I, I would urge you uh, just to jot down that name, Ernie Pyle. He was a, a, a reporter for the Scripps Howard newspaper chain, and he was probably the most widely read journalist in World War II. And if you want to know what Americans knew about the war as it was happening, you can look and see Ernie Pyle's journalism, um, which came back to the States um, almost a, a, you know, a couple times a week. And he wrote with amazing candor and amazing frankness about what was happening on the beaches to the boys that had been sent there. And it's amazing how vivid his writing is. And if you look at the few pieces that I put into your packet for this session, you'll see some of the, he was very frank um, about it. It wasn't as censored as you might have expected. He talked about the mess of the beaches. He wrote in one of his pieces of June 1944, the gigantic litter of wreckage along miles of shoreline, the submerged tanks and overturned boats and burned trucks and shell-shattered jeeps and sad little personal belongings, he wrote, were strewn all over these bitter sands. And then he wrote, that plus the bodies of soldiers lying in rows covered with blankets, the toes of their shoes sticking up in a line as though on drill. And other bodies, uncollected, still sprawling grotesquely in the sand or half hidden by the high grass beyond the beach. Basically, he was, he was telling it like he saw it. He talked about American, American uh, casualties. 
And of course, he went on to say that it was a miracle and these young men were heroic in what they'd accomplished, but he didn't hide the brutality of the war. Um, I mean, he had to mind his, he couldn't provide, of course, any details. He didn't say where they were in, in, with any specificity. But Ernie Pyle told the American public that the war was difficult and hard and that their young men were doing the best they could under difficult circumstances. Well, let me just transition now into the other side of the conflict, because I do want to um, leave some time, at, you know, if we've got uh, some plenty of time left, but I want to make sure I cover some of this other side of the picture. It's so important, I think, that we, 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 we um, always think about war as having a human dimension and that there are always civilians in wartime everywhere. There are always refugees. There are always cities that get bombed. And war is not just uh, about, about the struggle of soldiers against other soldiers, but it's also about civilian casualties. And we see this in our own world, of course, every day. I just want to spend a little bit of time on that. Um, so as you could imagine, in the weeks running up to the big landings, the British and the American uh, air forces and navies undertook a pretty heavy bombing campaign in France, in the areas where the landings were going to happen. And uh, this made life very miserable for many French people. And for in the cities and towns all across the, uh, the coastline of France. Now, mind you, the Americans didn't just bomb the neighborhood around Omaha Beach. Why not? Because that would have tipped the Germans as to where they were coming. So in order to deceive the Germans, the Air Forces bombed huge swaths of northern France um, because they didn't want to indicate where they were coming. And that made life very, very difficult. Look at this slide of the city of Rouen. Uh, this uh, was and still is a, a major an important town. It sits at a number of railway junctions. And the, the liberators, the Allies, knew the Germans were going to send reinforcements into France by train. So they wanted to destroy the train uh, junction in Rouen. And that just meant basically destroying the city. So Rouen endured repeated attacks from the air by the, by the Allies. And on one day, April 19, 1944, 900 people in this town, the city of Rouen, were killed by British bombing. And in June, a series of attacks killed an additional 200 people in Rouen. Now, this happens to be the town where that famous cathedral that the French painter Monet uh, painted so many times. And indeed, this is uh, the neighborhood around the cathedral. As you can see, it was badly, badly damaged. In addition to deaths from bombing, uh, the actual fighting, the, the difficult fighting that went on throughout the summer of 1944 had, as you could imagine, quite traumatic consequences for local people. Now, the reason this photograph looks a little funny is because I took a picture of this picture in the, the uh, National Archives in Washington. I found this in a box of old photographs. In Normandy, in that summer of 1944, hundreds of thousands of townspeople, I mean, who lived in all these buildings? Look at them, they're totally a wreck. Townspeople, the farmers, they were all displaced by the fighting. And so they had to flee out of Normandy and try to get away from the, the fighting while the armies around them churned up the fields and all the homes and the barns and killed off thousands and thousands of cattle. Normandy is a very agricultural area. and hundreds of thousands of, of cattle were killed in the bombing. And as you can imagine, they all began to rot in the summer of 1944. One of the things that American soldiers said over and over and over again about their experience in Normandy was how bad it smelled. On D-Day itself, Normandy uh, unfortunately suffered a lot of civilian deaths. About 3,000 French people were killed on June 6th and June 7th in Normandy. Now, I just want to pause and ask you to think about that number. 3,000 people killed in two days in this tiny, very remote, not, not densely populated area. You know, that had a traumatic impact on the memories of this part of the country. And, you know, we know what it's like to have an attack on your country in which 3,000 people are killed. We, we know what that trauma is like. That is what these communities went through um, in, in June of 1944. And about the same number, and this is why I want to try to get you to think about the balance here, about the same number of French civilians were killed as American soldiers. 
Allied soldiers. So there's a rough equilibrium there. And just interesting to think, what does that mean? What, 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 should we, what meaning should we draw from the fact that soldiers and civilians died in similar numbers? Throughout June, many more of this kind of bombing um, destroyed many of the small picturesque towns of Normandy, France. And by the end of the campaign in the summer of 1944, about 20,000 French civilians had been killed in the fighting in Normandy. Again, I know this is a little grim, but I do think it's important that we, we focus on the consequences. This is a city, a picture of the city of Caen, C-A-E-N, um, and it was the d destination of the British landing forces uh, in June. And here is a picture of some British and Canadian soldiers walking through the rubble of the city of Caen. Um, it, was, uh, uh, it took two months for the British to get to Caen. They fought bitterly for the control of the city from the Germans. They bombarded the city with air attack. Um, on the very day of the liberation, about 600 people were killed in this city and a couple of hundred more killed the following day. So you see, it was for six to eight weeks an absolute terrible place to be. The cathedral um, of the town of Caen was destroyed, and I have a picture of a before and after, which you can see was re repaired after the, the second after the war ended. Um, but it gives you a sense of the um, really shocking damage that occurred, and that must have been so shocking to the residents themselves. Here's a cathedral that had been in place for hundreds, hundreds of years. It would have been a place that everyone in that town had been to for a marriage or a funeral or a christening. They would have gone there on Sundays and elsewhere in the, in the, during the week. I mean, this was the centerpiece of many ways of the, the life of, of thousands of people living in the city of Caen. And yet, on, in just a matter of, of weeks, it was left into a shattered uh, mess. Uh, and this is a product of liberation. So people's emotions are, are think about how tumultuous it must have been to endure this suffering, but also at a moment of liberation and recovering your freedom. And I think that those tensions between joy and, and sadness are crucial to the story of, of liberation in 1944, as well as um, liberation at, at other times and places. One of the things that I found striking, and uh, uh, you know, I, I think that you'll agree that this has contemporary echoes, where did all these townspeople go? The city of Caen was a, um, had 60,000 people in it, and it was completely turned into rubble. Where did they go? Well, quite a few of them, tens of thousands of them, fled the city. And they, and they made their way as refugees south of the city towards some uh, old stone quarries that had been there for many hundreds of years that had, that had basically carved caves out of the stone in um, uh, in s south of Caen. The stone was actually highly prized and used to build many cathedrals around France and around Europe. But the result was there were these caves uh, a few miles south of town. And as many as 12,000 people fled the city and made their way to these underground caves where they began to set up a kind of uh, refugee villages. And here's a, an, a, one of the very few photographs I've been able to find of a picture of what it looked like on the inside. These basically French people from the city of Caen built these small little villages. They sprang up overnight. There were the elderly put in makeshift beds. Uh, women set up laundry and cooking facilities. The men uh, took on a sort of heavy labor of, of, uh, of you know, trying to dig potatoes out of the fields and hauling water and sawing lumber for communal kitchens. I just, I, th I think that we need to think a little bit about the, the, the life of a refugee community, which was occurring right here in the midst of the liberation, because refugee communities are like this all across the world and across time, and we see these in our own time. Men and women and their children trying to survive by coming together and building these makeshift villages under very, very difficult circumstances. These were airless caves, very difficult to live in. There was very little electric light. You can look at the floor and you see it's muddy. Why? It's, it's, of course it's muddy. These caves were actually used, uh, uh, <laughs> you won't believe this, but they were used to cultivate mushrooms. Um, so just imagine how damp and how, and how muddy it would have been. There were no toilets, no running water. Fleas and bed bugs and lice infested everybody. So this is an extremely difficult 
a period for the residents of the city of Caen as they were trying to survive the liberation. So it's, it's quite, um, quite amazing to think about how they managed to do so. There about 12,000 people living essentially underground during the liberation of the region. And by the end of, the t end of it, the city of Caen was really completely devastated, completely wiped out. Um, and the, 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 the residents were enormously grateful, of course, that they had been liberated. But as you can see, their city was unrecognizable. Now, when I was there um, some years ago to do research for some of these topics, I, um, there's a local archive there, and they'd collected a lot of papers and personal diaries and some of the writings of local figures. And uh, they had an amazing collection, a diary written by a Benedictine, uh, a, a nun from a Benedictine abbey who had experienced the, uh, the liberation. And I was able to, they kept a copy, and I was able to inspect it. And one of the things that I was so struck, because it really contradicted my ideas of the liberation, I had thought there would be so much joy and so much delight over the liberation of France. And there was, but what she wrote about her city and about this moment, I'll give you one quotation. She wrote in her diary, the Canadian and British armies have been received in Caen without great enthusiasm. The residents have been too shaken by the memory of days of agony and mourning which we have experienced, by all the civilian dead, by all the grief. There was not on this day the joy that we might have had if these friends had saved the women, the children, the old people. There has been too much suffering. Wow, that blew me away when I read it, and because it, it, it forced me to think differently about the, her the heroic story that I that I had told my students and that I, I, I that I still tell my students um, that even even at a time of recovering their freedom, the price that that these French villagers and city dwellers in Caen had to pay was very very high. Now there's one final. Um, plot, subplot, if you like, that I want to bring to your attention, um, and then I, I, I'm excited to hear your thoughts about some of this. Um, and that is a rather, a, 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 another difficult t a subject, but a really important, and I think um, quite moving one. And that deals with the following rather difficult topic. In the weeks following the liberation of northern France, a great deal of violence against women occurred. And this is a difficult subject to, to deal with for anyone, uh, to, certainly difficult to introduce to students, but it's very revealing of this moment in time and this moment in the war. In July and August of 1944, not just in Normandy, but in many other towns across France, this extraordinary public shaming of certain women took place. And these were women who had been, who were accused of having, having had relationships, sexual relationships probably, with the German soldiers who were occupying France. So remember, four years of a, of a long and difficult war, um, some people through desperation through or through genuine um, affinity of some kind um, developed friendships, perhaps sexual dependence upon um, and arrangements with, uh, out of desperation, with the German occupiers. Over the course of four years, uh, some French women and German uh, soldiers had encounters of one kind or another. Well, during the war, many people took note and they said, you know, you're going to get it one day, and they made threats and they made accusations. Well, here in the summer of 1944, you notice this picture. All of the people around these poor women are men and boys. There's a little boy on the right there looking, and they're all staring, and they're watching, and they're smiling. This is a settling of scores that tells us that France went through a civil war, a bitter kind of civil war, and the Guys who are on the winning side now, the, the resistance men standing around this circle, cutting off the hair of this poor woman, 
they are settling scores and they look vindictive and they look they look sadistic and that is exactly what is going on here the public shaving of the hair of women who were accused of consorting with their German occupiers. In the city of Cherbourg, which was that port I was talking about, um, in Cherbourg, just in, and, and, and you really won't believe this, but the date of this event when these women were, were assaulted in this way in public and had their head shaved was July 14, 1944. It was Bastille Day. It was France's National Liberation Day. And they were, their public humiliation was designed to be a public staging, if you like, of the, the um, victory of the forces of liberation against the Germans and against the German collaborators. And these women were accused of being collaborators. And you can see there's a man holding up a sign in the background that says, um, the wagon of collaborators and they are in fact sitting in a truck bed in this photograph and I've seen quite a few photographs of this entire sequence and these women were then driven around town in their state of public shame and humiliation with this sign the collaborators wagon um, being held above them and a man was beating a drum at the same time in order to bring public attention to the shame and the humiliation um, that these women were enduring. This happened, the picture you're looking at happened in the city of Cherbourg, but we know that this happened all across much of France in the summer of 1944 against women who were accused of having had some sort of sexual relationship with a, with a German. Clearly, uh, there is some kind of terrible uh, settling of scores, but also they are using women um, to demonstrate a new political order has arrived, and they are literally using the bodies of these women to establish this new political order. The old losers, the, the people who were pro-German, the collaborators, they are going to be shamed forever, and this new order of liberation and freedom is arriving. But look at the humiliation that it, that it, that it that this message is delivered with. To me, these are awful and, and unforgettable pictures. One historian has counted about 20,000 women were publicly humiliated in this way. And for me, it, it remains one of the most jarring and images and difficult to reconcile with all of the positive emotions that we want to associate with recovery of freedom in 1944. We know that these events happened across France and here's another example. These poor women have had a swastika daubed onto their forehead. They've been publicly beaten and their clothing has been torn and yet the men around them are smiling because they are signaling a change over from the old German order to the new post-war French order but they're doing it in a way that is incorporating this horrible violence that's very difficult to look at and very difficult to understand. Well, by the end of the summer of 1944, Normandy had been liberated, of course, and by May 8, 1945, World War II came to a blessed end. Um, and the, the France was was freed and, and so was the rest of Europe of the terrible tyranny of the German occupation. But as you can imagine, what was left behind was terrible devastation. Um, there were extensive ruins, not just in Normandy, but all across northern France where the fighting continued. There would be a housing shortage in many of these cities for, uh, for years um, as people tried to return back to their shattered towns and villages. Food was rationed in Normandy, which was an agricultural region famous for its dairy products and for its meat, but food was rationed um, for many months after the liberation. There was a great deal of petty theft and looting of damaged homes in the liberated zones. It would be years before things like streetcars and buses and trains were brought back, electricity and so on. And one major health problem uh, occurred uh, as you could imagine, um, uh, uh, prostitution was very widespread. Here we we have a classic uh, conundrum of uh, of wartime. We there were about 
almost uh, almost three million Allied soldiers um, in in Europe uh, towards the end of the war, and these guys were uh, in their late teens or early twenties, and they didn't know much, and they took advantage or were taken advantage of um, a very vigorous sex trade. Prostitution was legal in France, um, uh, but it was uh, poorly um, supervised, and the consequence was that uh, venereal disease ran rampant through the Allied armies in 1944 and 1945. Despite the army's efforts to uh, educate uh, soldiers about um, uh, about venereal disease and about the use of, of condoms, um, about 15 percent, believe it or not, 15 percent of the U.S. Army uh, soldiers had VD um, during the period of the last the last year of the war in Europe. So that was another social dimension <laughs> of the liberation. So with all of this turmoil, you can imagine that the local attitudes towards the liberators and the liberation, at least in the short run, at least in the short run, was a little bit fraught, a little bit um, difficult, prickly. And one editorial in a newspaper that I read, I think captured it, captured that bitterness um, very well. And it, they wrote, for the success of our allies, the region has paid an unbearable tribute. Entire villages have been pulverized, towns raised, cities wiped out. We do not complain. Fate determined that we should become the ransom for liberty. We have strong enough hearts to accept this with pride. We only ask that we not be forgotten. And as you can imagine, they were afraid that these provincial towns, which were not in Paris, would be forgotten and that they wouldn't be rebuilt. And it would take them, in fact, many, many years to recover from the cost of the liberation. Now, I'll just close by saying that, you know, given that it's December 7 and given that we're talking about, uh, about Americans at war, um, I don't want to close on a, on a negative note. By, by, by every stretch of the imagination, the French public then and now has been enormously grateful to um, to Americans for for freeing France from the German occupation and for defeating Germany. Of course, the Americans didn't do it alone. They had allies, especially the Russians, um, help them. But nonetheless, France has always held a a, um, a really really um, important place for Americans in their public uh, commemorations of World War II, especially older French people, um, and in Normandy especially. Um, but we, it would be wrong to forget that the liberation and the war itself was such a difficult and terrible um, experience. And, you know, I, I've been, as, I, as I'm sure some of you have been, to the American Military Cemetery in Normandy, and there are 9,385 Americans who are buried there. And there are over a thousand names listed on a memorial um, of men whose bodies were never recovered. So there are over 10,000 soldiers who are memorialized here in this beautiful setting, looking out over the, the, um, the, the, the English Channel and the, the wind blows through the pine trees there. Again, this is a scene memorialized beautifully by Steven Spielberg um, at the uh, close of Saving Private Ryan. And these are young men who, some of them were in their teens. Some of them were just like your students my students, and I, I, I think so tenderly of my own students who are in the ROTC program and who are themselves true believers in what they're going to do. Uh, they believe strongly in uh, helping their country, defending their country, serving their country, and they're the first young men and women to stand up and, and volunteer and go forward to do great things on behalf of their country. And I admire them, and I, I'm, and I feel emotional about their, them and about their futures because they are so um, courageous and, and determined to be patriotic. But I also feel a need to explain to them the costs of war, the price that they might have to pay, and they want to hear this. They know. They're not naive. They know how difficult war can be for both for soldiers and for civilians, and they're willing to take that um, take on that burden if they feel that their country needs them, and I, I admire them so much for it, and I'm sure you have students who are, who are very much like, like them. But I do think we have to remind our students as they think about their own futures that right now thousands of, of Americans lie in cemeteries like this across Europe. 
And they got there for good reasons to try to um, defeat tyranny. But we, we do need to encourage our young people to think about how they got there, uh, what happened to them when they got there, and what the cost uh, of liberation has been, how high it has been in different places. And we need to know going into future conflicts um, that suffering will happen, and it should happen in a good cause, uh, but that we need to be wary of the, uh, the human costs that come with war. Uh, and uh, e even, even good wars of liberation take a terrible toll. So I'm going to end my comments there. I, I know this is rather somber material. War is difficult to talk about, but I hope that this has given you some, some ideas about how you might incorporate uh, the story of war into your own um, classes in the future. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks so much, Will. We, we do have some questions. I've been queuing them up as, as you've given your comments tonight, and I'm also going to ask anyone to take these last few minutes to uh, pose a question that you might like us to address. But one, one thing that uh, came up early in your talk tonight, and it, this comes from Jenny Snotty down in Atlanta, um, she asked if you're aware of or if you have any impression of work done around the positive experience of war with soldiers, particularly in the sense of um, of, of, of addressing and surviving this sort of monumental event as something like Omaha Beach or, you know, in, in coming back to, uh, to their homeland and, and, and sort of re-immersing themselves in, in an old way of life. Is there work done on sort of the positive side of the way that soldiers uh, bond and, and, and deal with that? Well, I mean, look, I, I, of course there is, and um, there is, uh, uh, there is a, 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 there's a, a popular, a popular impression, of course, that um, that Americans did the right thing in World War II, and and heavens knows they did. I mean, this was, if ever there was a the right war to fight, it, the the war against Nazi Germany was it, and um, this is this is why so many Americans. Uh, gladly uh, suited up and went to went to war against the Germans and in in returning home um, they were of course uh, uh, treated uh, reasonably well and the war effort was thought of as a as a as a necessary undertaking but I uh, you know so we, we and Tom Brokaw's book the greatest generation I think has done a lot to capture the um, the ethos of the time, the sense that there was a generation of people who survived the, the difficulties of the Depression and then who survived the difficulties of World War II and really shaped post-war America. They were patriotic and self-sacrificing uh, and did a great deal to shape uh, the, the direction of the country. But I, I do think that if you, you, you don't have to look very far um, to realize that soldiers themselves often told um, a more sobering story. Uh, in some of the early uh, uh, war movies that came out right after is, uh, the war was uh, depicted a rather difficult homecoming. The Best Years of Our Lives, for example, is a wonderful movie about the difficulty of reintegrating into civilian life after the war. Um, and one of the things that I would urge you to do, uh, all of you to do, is to go to the Veterans Oral History Program, the Veterans Oral History Program at the Library of Congress. It's all digital and it's all online. You can go to the, to the uh, Library of Congress Veterans Oral History and there you can find uh, many, many, many interviews with World War II veterans. And since many of them are no longer alive, this is a priceless collection of material. And the, the, the interviews were taken in many, uh, many years over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And they are really revealing because those men, of course, were enormously proud of what they did. But they often tell us, tell, uh, remind us that um, it was hard, that they lost friends, that they didn't talk about their experiences very much when they came home because they were afraid that nobody would believe them uh, about how the difficult things that they saw. And so there's a generation of soldiers who came back from World War II who accepted and acknowledged the um, national praise, but also didn't talk very much about their experiences. I'm sure that some of our of our group here tonight know, uh, have a, a, a grandparent or a great uncle who was in World War II, and, and I bet you that, they, that, that, that maybe if he was in combat, he didn't talk about it very much. And that's very common. Um, there wasn't a culture of exhibiting and talking about uh, difficult times, and so a lot of it got bottled up. 
but do have a look at those oral histories. They're revealing. Your students can read them very easily and quickly, and you can extrapolate yourself what you think they mean and what the soldiers, how these men talk about their experiences. Well, I've got one last question for you to conclude tonight. Um, you, know, you teach university level uh, students. Um, you teach the students that our audience tonight have had two or three years ago. Um, the material we're talking about is 75 years ago. How, how relevant do you still find this topic with today's current students? Uh, my guess is it resonates pretty strongly. Um, how do you feel your students respond to this? Well, I think they're often amazed to see that there's that there's a, a counter story to the one we normally tell about World War II. If ever there was a good war, it was World War II. We all agree on that. But nobody likes to be uh, have their the images of positive images sort of sort of um, uh, challenged. And and I I do have to try to walk a fine line between introducing difficult material while also making sure that it's clear that we are embracing the legacy of what Americans did in World War II and that we we honor them. I mean, I'm, I just wrote a big book about Dwight D. Eisenhower. No one could be a bigger fan of the uh, American military experience. But but war is is difficult whenever it happens. And my job is to give students the critical faculties to ask the tough questions. If we go to war in place X or place Y, what are going to be the consequences? Um, what, what plans do we have in place to build out the civilian infrastructure after we damage it? Um, what kind of political order are we going to bring in in this area where we're going to liberate? These are the kinds of questions we have to ask, ask our, our leaders to make sure that they've done careful thinking about. So this topic resonates because it's, it's very much a part of where we are today in ex exercising American power around the world. Americans often um, make good choices about how to exercise power, but we have also made some regrettable ones, we, maybe some, some choices that we continue to debate today. But it's up to the students to make those judgments, and I feel like my job is to give them, um, give them an insight into the, the nature of war so that they'll be better positioned to make their own judgments, um, knowing full well that in order to do good things sometimes you have to take risks and make sacrifices and, and war is a classic example of a case where uh, there's no um, no easy way through. Sometimes it has to happen but they need to know what the cost really is, not just the cost in money but in lives and in uh, morale and in, uh, and in and the difficult uh, losses that every war brings about. Well, it's a fantastic uh, way to conclude. I want to thank you again for joining us and leading tonight's webinar. Uh, we hope to see you again at the National Humanities Center. Thank you all for your patience and for listening. I really enjoyed it. And I want to thank uh, everyone in attendance tonight for joining tonight's webinar uh, session. Uh, it was fascinating to hear Will Hitchcock draw these uh, stories together and to create these layers of a topic that we've heard in many cases, but is uh, sort of a sort of a new version of that. I want to encourage you to join us for future webinars. You can follow along at both the National Humanities Center website as well as our social media to see new and upcoming uh, sessions and uh, registrations. Um, I want to remind you too that your evaluation will pop up as soon as uh, we log out, and after completing that survey, you will receive a certificate uh, usually within the hour by email. So if that doesn't show up in an hour, two hours or so, check your spam box, make sure it wasn't filtered out. And if you have some kind of problem, please get in touch with Libby Taylor tomorrow morning. Um, I also want to remind you that we do record our webinars, including tonight's. And usually within 48 hours or so, this will be posted. You'll also have access to uh, the PowerPoint tonight and all the associated readings. I know that oftentimes those are some of the most valuable materials uh, in sessions like this. Our next webinar, uh, in fact, our last webinar of the fall semester is next Wednesday, December the 13th. I know in my screenshot I've got Thursday, but we had to bump it back a night. Uh, we'll be working with Andrew Huberic from the University of Missouri in Columbia. He's a professor of English, and he'll be working with us on the uh, sort of the, the ways in which U.S. fiction in the 20th century have both reflected and impacted United States foreign policy. So it's a, a nice interdisciplinary session of uh, of U.S. Uh, foreign policy as well as uh, U.S. literary studies. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day at school tomorrow. Uh, if we don't see you again this semester, have a great holiday, and we'll see you again in January. Good night.